next month. Or... Shall I stop that? Okay. Uh, next month is. Go ahead. Okay. Our program tonight is from Tony Bryan. He's been an amateur astronomer since childhood. He says that he was inspired by the Gemini and Apollo missions. Uh, I was inspired by the Wright brothers plane, but um, Tony's been president of DAS for, uh, I think, five years. Is that correct, Tony? Uh, yes. Five years. And he is a winner of the Astronomical League's Outreach Award because of his outreach efforts, uh, which have been extensive. He's also a contributing writer to an astronomy technology magazine and a NASA solar system ambassador. He's going to speak tonight on the James Webb Telescope, which I believe is set to launch on December 18th, if we believe that after all these years. Uh, and it will deal with background hardware and the mission itself. So, Tony, take it. Thank you, Chuck. Let me um, get my screen here. Can everybody at least see part of my screen, my desktop? Okay. Yeah. All right, let me clear these, uh, I think. Okay, <clears throat> let me get rid of some windows here. All righty, so the first section of our um, talk tonight is on the background of the James Webb Telescope. Um, James Webb, uh, this is from, from NASA, a quote from them. James Webb Telescope will be the premier observatory of the next decade, serving thousands of astronomers worldwide. It will study every phase in the history of our universe, ranging from the first luminous glows after the Big Bang to the formation of solar systems capable of supporting life on planets like Earth, to the evolution of our star system, our solar system, excuse me. The James Webb Space Telescope is a unique and very complicated design. Obviously, there were no commercial off-the-shelf solutions um, that met the design requirements. And the telescope Unlike Hubble, which is just a few hundred miles uh, in, in orbiting um, uh, fr from, the, from the surface of the Earth, this telescope has got a one-way ticket to a parking orbit at the uh, L2. Um, so NASA uh, Goddard Space Flight Center is managing the development of the effort. And the Space Telescope Science Institute will operate Webb after the launch. The prime contractor is Northrop Grumman. And um, obviously anybody that's followed the, the project has uh, learned it had numerous delays, major redesigns and cost overruns. Because of these, you may have heard the project referred to as the telescope that ate astronomy. So you must be aware though that, that NASA receives the last portion of of funding from the government. So military priorities and other constraints force NASA to work around the money they receive. Uh, some years they're, they're well-funded and some years their funding falls way short of projections or they actually get reductions in the funding that they already had. So they have to work around that. All righty. So, Hang on. Alrighty, so here's our little timeline for, for the, the project. Um, a little background. In 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope launched. That's the, uh, the, the, the predecessor, if you will, to, to this um, telescope. Somebody's, can somebody mute? Okay. 
in 1996, uh, development actually began for a launch that was initially planned in 2007 with a $500 million budget. In mid-1996, NASA invited ESA, the uh, European Space Agency, to cooperate in studies uh, using We've their... got background noise, Tony, a lot of it. Yeah, somebody... Can, can, you, me, can you mute everybody from your end? I cannot. Let's see. I can't mute anybody from from this position. So everyone, can you check and make sure that you're that you're muted? Because you're forever connected by love to touching center diamonds. Okay, hang on. Alrighty. I think I've got everyone there. Alrighty. Um, so in 96, uh, NASA invited the European Space Agency uh, to cooperate with them. Um, and as a result of that, uh, excuse me, the, um, they formed a task force um, to start working uh, on, on the uh, initial design and uh, areas that the Europeans um, can uh, support the telescope, which then was called the Next Generation Space Telescope, NGST. In May of 1999, NASA um, went out to industry to um, help seek solutions for the Next Generation Space Telescope. Um, two $12 million contracts were awarded uh, for uh, different competing designs that was, that was almost like a, a a, a pre-designed stage. In 2002, um, NASA renamed the Next Generation Space Telescope to the James Webb Space Telescope. For James E. Webb, who was the administrator of NASA from 1961 until 1968, he played an integral role in the Apollo program, including um, the fire of Apollo 1. He was also involved in the uh, Mercury and Gemini programs as well. Um, in 2002, also, the um, NASA awarded the JWST contracted truck contract to TRW. And at that time, the launch date was set to uh, 2010. Later that year, TRW was acquired, was acquired by Northrop Grumman in a hostile bid. And that company became Northrop Grumman Space Technology. In September of 2003, NASA entered, uh, issued a change order uh, that was effective in September 3rd of 2003 uh, to Northrop Grumman, which uh, implemented, implemented a replan to the program to accommodate a launch date of 2011. That was to accommodate funding. Um, jumping, let's see, all the way to 2005, things were running smoothly, more or less, until then. Uh, in 2005, uh, replan um, took place, and the life cycle cost then was determined to be $4.5 billion. That compromise, compromise excuse me, comprise, uh, 3.5 billion for design and development, and 1 billion for 10 years of operation. At that time, uh, the European Space Agency was contributing 300 million, um, and that was uh, partly due to they were going to contribute the launch. And uh, Canada also uh, began to deliver contributions and equipment uh, to the telescope as well. Excuse me. My mouse is extremely sensitive, and when I uh, when I bump it, it changes the slide. So, in two thousand eight, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, went through their preliminary design review. That was a that's a gate review. Anybody familiar with systems engineering? 
uh, recognizes that at the PDR, uh, all of your um, allocations have been uh, made, like your uh, requirements to what hardware is going to take care of those requirements. Generally, uh, block diagrams are available of the systems. Uh, initial modeling and simulations of various components uh, would be available. Um, and then um, from that point, once you uh, meet your, your uh, objectives for that review, you're um, authorized to move into the um, PDR phase. So that was executed. And in um, 2010, um, the CDR took place, which is a critical design review. At that gate review, uh, you've got all of your schematics, all of your block diagrams are done, all of your requirements have been um, um, modeled and simulated uh, to, to a point where you know that design will, will, will should meet the requirements. No testing has occurred at that point, just modeling on, on the designs. In 2011, so uh, we had some, some problems um, causing overhaul of some of the design and another budget increase and slip of the launch date to 2018. In 2016, the construction was completed um, and it began the extensive testing phase. So during the testing phase in 2017, we had some issues, uh, both funding and uh, 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 completion of different test aspects and the launch date slipped to 2019. In March of 2018, before even hitting the 2019 date, uh, the telescope SunShield ripped during a practice deployment and uh, that had to be, the design had to be corrected. And along the way, the schedule was once again pushed back for a launch date of 2020. In June of 2018, launch was delayed again, uh, following recommended recommendations from uh, IRB, an independent uh, review board. Um, activities like strengthening the sun shield took longer than expected. That cut into the project's schedule reserves. Uh, which are extra time NASA set aside to account for unforeseen problems. As a result, NASA had less reserve than planned to complete the remaining activities. In March of 2020, work on integration and testing of the telescope was suspended due to COVID-19, adding further delays. Following the work uh, resumption, the launch date was delayed again to October 31st, 2021. More problems with the area and five launch vehicles subsequently pushed the launch date back to what we have now, which is December 18th of 2021. So cost of the telescope has nearly doubled uh, to 9.67 billion since the 29, uh, 2009 baseline. Um, it's, it's um, um, exponentially more than the original NASA's original uh, notion that they could get a, a, um, a next generation telescope for, for $500 million. <clears throat> okay, so uh, with this telescope and all the program slips and all the funding uh, uh, increases, Remember this, there's only one chance to get this thing right. And if something wasn't right, it was made right. So trial and error doesn't apply when it comes to the telescope operations after launch. There's no possible way to repair or service this telescope as it stands right now in the L2 orbit. Um, so it has to work when it goes out or um, it will be um, either crippled or um, something, um, it will, will not work as expected. Requirements will not be met. So let's go through a little bit of the hardware. Obviously, it's a very complicated telescope. There's no way that I could go through all of the hardware, but I'll just touch base on, on some of the, hit, hit the high, high points. 
So the James Webb Space Telescope um, is an infrared telescope. And so infrared telescopes allow you to see through, um, through clouds of matter in the, um, you know, in nebula and things like that. And so just as an introduction, we've got the trapezium on the left in the uh, visible uh, from the Hubble Tape Space Telescope. And then the trapezium uh, on the right side image in the uh, near IR uh, that was uh, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. You can note that you can see a lot more uh, through, the, uh, through the IR than you can with the visible <clears throat> in this photo. All righty, so this slide sort of introduces us to the requirements of, of, the, uh, of the telescope. So first requirement was, it was to have seven times the light gathering capability of the Hubble. Second requirement was Hubble-like angular resolution in the near infrared. And third major requirement is observing capability <clears throat> spanning the, um, um, uh, near, but near to the mid infrared spectrum. So the James Webb Space Telescope requires the largest cryogenic cooled telescope ever constructed. The figure on the left hand side of the page shows a little scale of the mirrors of the Hubble, which is a two and a half meter mirror or 2.4, I believe. Um, the Herschel Space Telescope is next to this. And if you'll notice that the James Webb telescope uh, segmented mirror is, is, is huge compared to the, uh, to the Hubble. So the images on the right hand side show the, uh, a simulated uh, image of the um, of an infrared universe using the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, compared to the image beside that, which is the from the Spitzer uh, uh, Space Telescope. The um, James Webb Space Telescope will acquire the greater resolution in, in a thousand, the, uh, the simulation shows a thousand second uh, exposure, and the Spitzer shows a 25 hour uh, exposure. So um, you can read the little bullet spanners at the bottom of the slide, but also um, recognize that the uh, MIRI instrument, which is uh, one of four uh, instruments on the telescope, actually needs to be cryogenically cooled, uh, and that's done with helium down to uh, 6.7 degrees Kelvin which is minus uh, 447 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 266 degrees centigrade. The other temperatures you see there are the normal operating temperatures for the remainder, remaining uh, uh, instruments. So here's a little overview of the uh, <clears throat> mission hardware. Um, over on the left-hand side, we've got a little figure of the uh, area Ariane 5 launch vehicle. And beside that is a, a, a cartoon, if you will, of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope uh, folded and uh, stowed for launch. So the, um, we're gonna focus on the, the picture, the image on the right-hand side of the screen here to get an overview of the hardware. Um, you'll see a pointer to the primary mirror. Um, the mirror consists of 18 hexagonal mirror segments. Uh, the segments are coated with gold to reflect IR light. Each segment is 1.3 meters in diameter, which is 4.3 feet. Uh, the hexagonal shape allows for folding in order to fit within the launch vehicle fairing and un unfold during deployment. Uh, the mirrors can be reshaped by actuators to one ten thousandths the thickness of a human hair. So um, to the right there, we have the secondary mirror, 
which just like in a Newtonian telescope, um, reflects the gathered the light gathered by the primary and back to the instrument module, which will be discussed in the next slide. The solar array, ray, which is down to the uh, bottom left-hand side of that figure, um, provides uh, the, uh, the, the energy to power all of the electronics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the bottom area titled spacecraft bus is where all the electronics uh, resides. Um, other than the uh, instruments um, consisting of processors, control circuits, power supplies, and radios. Uh, the sun shield, uh, which is um, uh, on the, I guess the, the um, caption for that is on the right-hand side, is, uh, is five layers. It's made from Kapton, which is a trademark name of a polyimide film uh, developed by manufactured by DuPont Pot. You may have seen Kapton in various photos of space hardware. Usually it's the it's an orange brown colored material that wraps around wiring harnesses. Um, it can also be used for flexible circuits and conformal circuitry such as a conformal antenna. That's an antenna that's uh, that's shaped uh, like over uh, you know the front end of a fighter uh, F-35. Um, each layer of the sun shield is coated with aluminum, and the first and second layers have an additional coating of dope silicon to provide extra shielding capacity. I don't know if you can see me. I hope you can. I can't see myself, um, but I actually have a, a sheet of Kapton here. It's a very flexible material. Um, some people confuse it uh, for with uh, mylar but it's not mylar. Um, it's a very good insulator. Um, it can be sputtered. Uh, it can be uh, adhesive, can be uh, applied to it, and it could end up being tape. Um, and there's lots and lots of uses for, for Capcon. It comes in various thicknesses. Um, I'm not sure what thickness that the uh, that telescope used, but this is uh, a, a material called uh, Tabby. It looks to be uh, about a tenth, a tenth of a meal. All righty. So let me move to the next slide. So here, here are the four instruments um, that are on the um, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, three of them are in the near infrared, and one of them is in the mid infrared. Uh, the uh, Neri Cam, near cam rather, the first instrument uh, uh, on, the, on the table is provided by the University of Arizona. Uh, this is the telescope's principal imaging instrument. It can utilize a chronograph. Uh, it has a chronograph built into it to block light emanating from bright sources, such as a star, uh, which uh, when you're imaging a planetary system. Uh, chronograph works the same way as you would with your hand uh, driving into the sunset. You know, it has a little uh, uh, device that can actually, you know, block the light from the star, like you would block the light from the sun while you were driving. That's the best analogy I can give. The next instrument is the near infrared spectrograph, um, or near spec. It's provided by the European Space Agency, uh, which also has components provided by the by NASA. Um, in images from this instrument can take as long as 100 hours, but it has micro shutters that allows for multiple images to be taken simultaneously. So each, each uh, segment of that, of that uh, spectrograph um, can be um, uh, either not utilized or utilized, and 100 of them could actually be functioning um, over, over, say, a, a, a field. Uh, and um, you could uh, take up to 100 spectrographic images um, at the same time with that instrument. The next in instrument is the MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. Um, that's the only mid-infrared instrument on the, on the telescope. It's provided by a European consortium with the European Space Agency and also by the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. Uh, the Miri has a camera and a spectrograph 
that works in the longer wavelengths, like I said, that can penetrate thick dust clouds, like that in the trapezium or in uh, merging galaxies or anywhere that you had a lot have a lot of, of uh, uh, thick dust clouds. Uh, the MIRI is the instrument that needs to be cooled cryogenically to um, 6.7 degrees Kelvin. The final of the four instruments is the fine guidance sensor near infrared imager. And it has a, also has a slitless spe spectrograph on it. Um, it's provided by the Canadian Space Agency. And the, uh, the telescope actually can be uh, directed by the fine, fine guidance sens sensor. Um, moving to the next slide. Alrighty. So here's a little comparison of the spectrum coverage uh, between Hubble, that's on the uh, left, and the James Webb, which is on the right. So if you look down to the uh, to the spectrum on the bottom of the of the slide, you'll see um, going from um, um, uh, excuse me from from far infrared on the on the right hand side all the way up through ultraviolet. Uh, Hubble only covers from ultraviolet down to parts of the near infrared spectrum. The James Webb Space Telescope starts at the near infrared spectrum and goes way down in the bottom of the mid infrared spectrum. So it can see in the infrared a, a lot deeper than the, than the Hubble. So here's a, a partially deployed James Webb Space Telescope, as it would look um, um, as, as it's um, beginning to deploy. Uh, you'll note in this image uh, that the, um, the, the outriggers that support the um, uh, thermal shielding are partially deployed. And uh, the uh, primary mirror is actually raised from, uh, from where it normally is. The two outboard wings of the primary mirrors have not been unfolded yet, and the secondary uh, mirror has not been uh, unfolded yet. So that's a little, I guess, snaky photo of, of, the, uh, of the telescope. That was a bad analogy, but nonetheless. So here's the uh, telescope that is uh, folded as it would look basically within the fairing of the Arian 5 uh, rocket fairing. So now we're gonna move on to mission. So after decades of waiting, here we are. And so I have a quote from the James Webb Space Telescope Program Director Gregory Robin. Is now that we have an observatory and rocket ready for launch, I'm looking forward to the big day and amazing science to come. And I hope that we all are as well. So the uh, James Webb Space Telescope is planned to launch on top of a, a European Space Agency's Ariane 5 rocket in late 2021, December 18th of 2021, if the schedule holds, from French Guiana. So here is our <clears throat> launch and deployment timeline. This is basically the, the, the first um, 29 or so days of, of launch, uh, after launch. Uh, the, um, this, this period is going to be nail-biting time for NASA, obviously. Um, from, from launch to uh, uh, parking at the Lagrange Point L2, um, which is about a million miles from Earth. Um, a lot happens. In the first month, we've got two, two major tasks. The first is to uh, get away from the Earth. Oops, excuse me. Get away from the crowds uh, and move to the uh, L2, uh, recalculating and adjusting the route as needed. This, the second of those tasks is to unpack and set up the camp. So that consists of deploying the arrays, uh, deploying the antennas, 
unfurling the sun shield, uh, un unfolding the primary mirror and the wings, secondary mirror support, um, and unlocking the mirror segments to form one large mirror. Um, so this diagram shows um, tasks such as those, but there's a more accurate and detailed animation uh, that's part of a YouTube video. And if you bear with me, I'm going to uh, see if I can share that. One moment. And there's music um, that goes with this. And if um, if the sound doesn't come through, uh, just just um, bear bear with me. It, all it was was interesting music. Let's see. Um, give me a thumbs up, someone, if you could actually see it and hear the music. Good? Okay, good. I'm gonna get you guys off here the screen now. Okay. <clears throat> Alrighty, so moving on to uh, commissioning the JSWT. It's a very complex six month process. Uh, we already uh, went through and discussed a little bit about the deployment phase, which is uh, the, the blue section on the left hand side of the timeline. Um, then we're going to continue with, uh, with the cooling of the instruments, the grade section there. Um, cooling of the instruments actually began as we uh, traveled out away from the earth. So um, cooling takes uh, 
longer than um, than 100 days actually uh, to get the telescope down to its its final cooling operation temperature. Uh, the reason is is once we get so far out, the, they actually slow the cooling so that the, um, th there's no condensation uh, forming anywhere on, on optical surfaces. Um, then we begin uh, commissioning the telescope, which is a complex alignment process of the uh, mirrors and instruments uh, and light path. Uh, the telescope commissioning will determine in-flight performance of the telescope, such as uh, point spread function, which is angular resolution, and, uh, and or long-term uh, image stability. Uh, they'll know that by being able to monitor the, uh, the temperature of, of, the, of the telescope. Uh, finally, in the green section there um, of, of the timeline, you've got the science ins instrument commissioning. In this phase, um, we perform a thermal characterization, uh, final cryogenic cooling of the MIRI instrument, and bring the instruments to readiness. Uh, science commissioning will provide a much more complete picture of science performance. At the end of science, <coughs> excuse me, science commissioning, let me take a drink here. It's just the first preliminary uh, images will be flowing out of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. So at about the 180 day mark from launch, um, expect to start seeing some, some images. Uh, after that 180 day uh, cycle one observations begin. <clears throat> so there are uh, four instruments. The four instruments have 17 distinct uh, observing mode. Obviously we don't have time to go through all of them. So I'll focus on a couple that really excite me. The, uh, the first is detecting the spectra of so, Tony, yes. Tony, yes. Uh, you're still showing the uh, YouTube. I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see here. Uh, how about now? Yeah, good. OK, sorry about that. Sure. So there, there's the timeline I was talking about. Um, sorry if I um, um, had, a, had a, a little spiel without having a graphic to go with it. So we start on the left-hand side with deployment, which is the, uh, the trip out. Uh, cooling, uh, which is, uh, begins as we're traveling out and then also for a few days in the uh, parked orbit at L2. Uh, then we move to telescope commissioning. Uh, and then science instrument commissioning. Uh, afterwards, um, we can actually start um, observation. Some of the instruments take a lot more time to, um, to final, uh, get them final ready than others. And so that will uh, determine which, which types of observations will be able to be done first. There's what I was talking about, the four instruments and the 17 uh, observing modes. So as I was talking, one of the things that excites me is uh, detecting the spectra of, of exoplanet atmospheres. And so um, as a um, exoplanet passes in front of its star, uh, the planet's atmosphere absorbs some of the spectral lines from the light of, of the star. Um, so things like water, CO2, and other molecules. Um, absorb in the IR, so we'll be able to detect um, what, what constituents uh, are um, present in the atmosphere of a transiting planet. A uh, little graphic on the right-hand side shows how that would happen. So basically, you get a baseline. Uh, you have a transit of the, uh, the planet. Uh, uh, obviously, spectral lines are missing. And then from there, you can determine what happened? So here's, here's what the um, James Webb telescope might be able to do for um, exoplanet uh, a system such as uh, Travis. 
So um, TRAPPIST 1C uh, is, a, is, is a planet here shown um, towards the center of this, of this image. Um, it's just outside the habitable zone. Uh, in four to 20 days, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope um, could, could provide us of an image to uh, tell us if this is a Venus-like world. A uh, similar measurement could be done for TRAPPIST-1e, uh, which is within the habitable zone. Um, if we decided to use about a month of the, of the telescope time to, uh, to do that, uh, for this uh, later exoplanet, we could detect signatures of CO2 um, or, or uh, H2O. In the uh, in the exoplanet atmosphere, that would mark a huge milestone uh, in the uh, exploration of rocky worlds outside of our solar system. So the second thing that excites me is seeing further back. So so right now um, we have an image of from the uh, ultra deep field taken by the wide field camera three IR instrument on on the Hubble. It took 16 days. Um, to acquire this image. It used uh, four filters spanning uh, one to two microns. The uh, uh, near cam on the James Webb telescope can replicate this image in seven hours, um, including overheads. And so in seven hours, the, uh, the James Webb can see as deep as we've ever seen. So, but uh, why, why, stop, why stop there? Um, with an expanding universe, the light that's further away from us is shifted more and more to the red. And the James Webb can see much redder, um, uh, uh, longer wavelength than the Hubble Space Telescope. So effectively, it can capture uh, the, uh, the old and new stellar populations of even most uh, distance galaxies in this image, uh, peering back to the time of, of galaxy formation. Um, and we should be able to further chart the evolution of, uh, of our um, universe over cosmic time. So I've got a couple of links provided to uh, that'll that'll steer you to additional um, uh, James Webb Space Telescope information. Uh, I uh, hope that you've uh, enjoyed this presentation. And I'm going to uh, stop the sharing and get everyone uh, back. Hopefully. All righty. And um, you know, I've only had uh, one official training class on James Webb and uh, done some uh, independent research on the internet. I'm not a, an expert by any means. Uh, I've got a little bit of knowledge. Obviously, it's a very complicated uh, instrument or group of instruments. And uh, people have de dedicated decades of their lives to this thing already. Uh, so, but I will take uh, some questions. I may not have the answers, but if you're interested in getting an answer back, if I don't have one, I can research it and, uh, and get back to you. Um, and yes, uh, Matt, the telescope can uh, image active galacti uh, uh, nuclei. Um, so active, active galactic nuclei, yeah. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and so if you're interested um, you can actually propose. Uh, there are openings, unless you already have, uh, to. Propose. Not yet, but <laughs> the, I remember when I first started grad school, um, I went to a couple conferences and it was like, it was the big thing because it was supposed to launch basically right around um, at that point, they had a launch date of 2014. So it was supposed to be like, Right before I grad, right, right before I got my PhD, and it was the next big thing, and then we're still waiting on it. So, <laughs> yeah, put in a proposal. Um, one of the links actually will take you um, to a, a page set up 
where you know you and or your team or whatever can propose a, a project and get some time on the telescope. Uh, the telescope is is um, uh, it should last uh, five years. Um, it is um, the um, the factor that would cause it not to operate longer than five years is fuel. Um, even though it's in a at L2, it's in a quasi stable uh, orbit in L2, and so it does have to have corrections. So it does have to use fuel in order to maintain uh, maintain that L2 orbit. So oh, the last. You know Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, do you know how long uh, the cryogenics on it will last? I was going to ask that because obviously helium isn't, unless they're somehow compressing it from who knows what, um, that is should would be a factor as well. But since it wasn't mentioned in any of the uh, training that I had, I'm going to say that they're not concerned at all with the amount of helium that's on there uh, because let's face it, even though it's pretty cold, they're, they're probably only hitting it with helium um, uh, very infrequently uh, because it's already at Because I know that was the big limiter for Spitzer um, and why it stopped being useful is because it ran out of cryogenics. Mm -hmm. But it, it definitely, it lasted longer than its nominal lifetime too. So they probably yeah. have built in that. The they, cryogenics. Other stuff will fail before the cry. They run out of cryogenics. Yeah, there's there's probably if if the engineers on this is are like any of the engineers that I've worked on military uh, projects, they're they're very conservative in their estimates and they pile as much expendables on the on there as they can. So um, you know, any any time that gets cut is when somebody starts really look, hitting them hard on on weight or <laughs> anything, anything else like that. So, okay, Mitch, see you later. See you at the museum. Uh, all righty, anyone else? Uh, what will first light be on this telescope? About 180 days, do you know what the targets would be? Uh, the targets will be chosen depending on which instruments they get up first. So uh, I, I would assume that the the, the uh, wide field camera will be the first thing that we get an image from. So I will also say that the NASA channel will probably have nearly a continuous feed. It's gonna be really, really busy for, for the time from launch until you know uh, launch plus 29 days or so. Um, so, you know, once, just a few minutes after launch, things start deploying. So there's going to be a lot of interesting uh, video feeds uh, to keep retired people and others occupied over uh, the, uh, the latter part of December and first part of January. Any more questions? Five years strikes me as a very short period. But I understand, I understand the reason. I, I just, is there any chance it would go considerably longer? Yeah, the last I heard that they're very confident um, if all the instruments come up well, that the telescope would last much longer. And I haven't heard what much is. There's no quantitative uh, uh, amount to put that, but much longer than the, the planned five years. I mean, look at how long Hubble lasted. And yeah, we did do some repair work on it, but still, it would, most of the time, the nominal life cycle they give to space telescopes is, I'm like the Kepler Space Telescope, I think also had a nominal five-year lifetime and ended up going almost 10. Yeah. So well, it, it just, it, as Tony said, I think it's just a very conservative engineering estimate. And while, because I, th I also think it has to do with funding. So they, they have said an initial five year, we're going to support, do mission mm -hmm. support on it. And then if everything's still working, then then they go back and say, okay, we want some more funding to continue mm -hmm. mission support. I think that that might have more to do with it than anything else. Yeah, the probably people in Congress and, and people in uh, uh, Office of, of Management and Budget uh, like to see like to see hard stops on things so they can get an idea they don't want to price out something for for a much longer period than it than um, yeah. than they think it's going to last 
Oh, I know a lot of space probes usually have a nominal lifetime of five years. So it probably is a budgeting thing more than anything else. And a lot, a lot of them go a lot longer than that, but their initial life, quote, lifetime is five years. Mm -hmm. So for the cost of this thing, I hope we get a lot of good science. Uh, <laughs> so I hope there's a lot of time with so many instruments on it and so many instruments that can operate simultaneously. Um, we should be able to get a lot of, a lot of science on. Any further questions? I think, a, I think a senior was projected at four years and it ran, what, 27? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think that all the, uh, all the people are doing really good uh, these days with, with coming up with uh, hardware, uh, both, both landers, uh, rovers, and whatnot that, that far exceed expectations. So. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, thank you very, very, very much for, for joining me this evening and uh, hope to see you all uh, at a later time. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.